I think there's two important things to know about me. I, I've been asked to introduce myself. Uh, one is I only have 20 minutes. Uh, and two is I'm a philosopher who is a creeping psychologist. Uh, and if you want to know anything more, you can ask me later. Um, I, I want to talk about the cognitive psychology and the implications that that has for, the, for religious belief. I, if I'd had more time and if people have questions, I probably would be interested in talking also about the evolutionary psychology of religion. Uh, but instead, I'll just talk about the cognitive psychology of religion. And it's of interest to me because as a philosopher, I've been a longtime defender of what's come to be known as reformed epistemology. Uh, reformed epistemology traces its roots back to John Calvin. Uh, who's as reformed as they come. Um, and he wrote a long time ago, there is within the human mind, and indeed by natural instinct, an awareness of divinity. The view of reformed epistemology has come to be associated with the work of Alvin Plantinga and Nicholas Waltersdorf. Uh, I was a Plantinga student a hundred years ago, and um, when I was his student, I wrote a defense of reformed epistemology. And I also wrote a popular book on reformed epistemology. Uh, it's called Return to Reason. It's also subtitled affectionately, but not really. Uh, I read it online somewhere, Planning for Dummies, uh, uh, if you want to see it. Um, the, uh, the ideas there are ideas that were defended by a philosopher and, of course, by a theologian, which means that they were defended for no reason whatsoever. Uh, it just seemed to us to be true. And interestingly, in the 90s and um, at the turn of the century, a lot of work was being done in the cognitive science of religion that began to make us think that there might be actual empirical evidence for uh, something like reformed epistemology. And we philosophers seldom have any empirical evidence for anything that we believe, so I got really excited. Um, <laughs> and started looking into this. And I, I noticed some similarities between John Calvin and uh, one of the leaders in the field, Justin Barrett. You gotta look closely, but I, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Justin, by the way, did, was my student at Calvin College, so it's probably, uh, uh, and Barrett probably is Beret or something like, it's probably some French name anyway. Um, it turns out that uh, Justin and others who worked in this area um, began to defend something like a God faculty, something like this awareness of divinity. And Justin himself says this about the God faculty, belief in God generally and God particularly arises through the natural operation of human minds in natural, ordinary environments. That belief in God is natural somehow, that it's, um, that it's relatively universal, it doesn't mean that everybody have religious beliefs, but that normally functioning, um, generally adults will, through the normal course of their history, acquire religious beliefs. And um, the research in this area suggests that belief in God arises from a set of cognitive faculties that um, most, mat what they call maturationally natural adults seem to have. Um, a sense, a tended, tendency to see purpose in nature, a teleological sense, uh, hyperactive agency detection disorder, uh, not disorder, uh, <laughs> uh, device. Uh, I'm going to look at the disorder in a little bit. Um, that we have a theory of mind, that we not only detect agency, that there are things that can act and that we might want to prepare to respond to, but also that um, things act for reasons. And then we attribute reason and purpose to things. Uh, evolutionarily, it's likely was useful that we could plan our actions in response to um, believed purposes that agents might have. And also, religious beliefs seem to have some kind of inference potential. They seem to explain a lot of um, areas of human experience that might otherwise be uh, inexplicable. And this, this set of cognitive faculties seems to work together to produce in normally functioning adults uh, religious belief. Uh, and it seems to do this across cultures. Um, and so it seems to be uh, culturally recurrent uh, and one that's probably best explained by this set of cognitive faculties. And they found the God faculty, um, and it's here. <laughs> now, we're probably all familiar with the, a lot of the work of the new atheist, Richard Dawkins' The God Delusion. Uh, Daniel Dennett's Breaking the Spell. 
Um, and many of these, the key insight in the book, uh, the books are usually 400 pages long, the key insight is usually only in a page or two, um, and um, in, uh, in Dawkins' case, uh, maybe not even that much. At any rate, they tend to make claims based on this uh, discovery that we have cognitive faculties or that we're naturally inclined to religious beliefs. Um, the, the claims are something like this, that the, in Dawkins and the God delusion, the delusion part is that we have this cognitive faculty that would produce this belief no matter what. Or I think in Dawkins' case, he thinks there isn't a God, so he thinks, why is it that so many people believe something that's so patently false? And he thinks so many people would believe what's so patently false because we're naturally inclined to believe it in almost any circumstance. And so uh, most people are naturally inclined to affirm a delusion, the delusion that God exists. And if you can get him to say, um, as kind of an argument, why he thinks the discovery of the cognitive faculties show that belief in God is a delusion, it boils down to something like this. The irrationality of religion is a byproduct of a particular built-in irrationality mechanism in the brain. Um, and so I think the general claim here, the general claim that somehow what's discovered in the cognitive science of religion undermines or undercuts rational religious belief is based on this sense that the God beliefs are produced by an unreliable cognitive faculty, and any belief produced by an un unreliable cognitive faculty are, ir uh, sorry, are irrational. And this is a quote, a rough quote from Dennett in Breaking the Spell. And the spell that gets broken is the spell that so many people believe in God, and he thinks his book or cognitive science has finally broken the spell, that we can get over this collective illusion um, that people have a belief in God, and that the spell is broken by understanding that these beliefs are produced by an unreliable cognitive faculty. And he calls the God faculty a fiction generating contraption. Jesse Baring, probably the most um, unrestrained in his comments on these sorts of things, says, we've got God by the throat. All we need to do is squeeze. So it's the discovery of a God faculty has generated quite a um, industry in folks that think that once and for all, we've shown that belief in God is irrational. And, and so far, frankly, I don't think we've had an equal and opposite response, at least in terms of the popular press. Uh, nonetheless, I think there are responses to make, and I want to develop uh, some of the responses just quickly. Um, and to me, the response goes something like this. Suppose, um, and this is, Jeff, you can tell Karsten, oh, if you're, are you checking your email, Jeff? Uh, um, Karsten Heyman, that, um, as one of my students and a friend, longtime friend of Jeff Schloss, he, he brought up this example, and it really, I think, shows what a response might be. Um, suppose Karsten goes to a party, and on his way to a party, his brother Damon gives him a pill, and the p pill produces a belief that there's a large pink elephant in the room. So he goes to the party, and Karsten tells everybody there's a large pink elephant in the room. And everyone kind of chuckles because they know Dathan gave Karsten that pill. Now, suppose they're also chuckling because the pill did produce the, pink, the belief that there's a large pink elephant in the room. But suppose also there is a pink elephant in the room um, that, that, as a joke, Dathan had brought in a large pink elephant and put it in the room. So everyone knew it was there, but they all knew Karsten only believed on the basis of the, of the pill, that Karsten's cognitive faculties had been stimulated in such a way that he developed a belief in the pink elephant pill, sorry, in a, belief, in a pink elephant, but it was only produced because he took the pill. It wasn't produced by a perception of the pink elephant. Now, I think that's roughly what Dawkins and Dennett think belief in God is like, that people are believing in God, something like having taken a pink elephant pill. They, they have this belief uh, in God, and they would have it whether or not there were a God. And what produces the belief is these cognitive faculties it's not being produced by God. So I, I think in the pink elephant pill, we can see what might be needed in the case of rational perceptual belief. And then I want to take this and think about what would be needed in order for belief in God to be rational. For a perceptual belief to be rational, I think um, for someone to have 
a rational perceptual belief that there's a pink elephant in the room, you would want to know that the right processes were involved. And so the right processes would be uh, for perceptual belief, when my visual faculties convey information to those portions of my brain that process visual information, sensations, and then transfer that information to the portion of my brain involved in believing. So my visual faculties, I have to, I have to see something in order for me to have a uh, perceptual belief, at least a visual perceptual belief, and that information needs to be transferred reliably to the belief portion of my brain. Uh, but also, in order for me to have a rational perceptual belief, I also need to be in the right relation to the object of perception. And so, in the case of a perceptual belief, the object needs to be the cause of my belief. So the pink, in order for me to have a, per, the, a rational perceptual belief of a pink elephant, I'd have to be in visual proximity of a pink elephant. My eyes would have to be open. You know, the lights would have to be on. And the ultimate cause of that belief would have to be the pink elephant. So I have to be in the right relation to the cause of that belief. Now, uh, I want to think about what it would take for a belief in other minds to be rational. And I've picked um, data here. And hopefully, everyone understands the cultural reference. Uh, data is a robot. Data doesn't have a mind. So um, and, um, in order to perceive other minds, uh, um, there's always somebody actually who's more expert in Star Trek who knows that Data really has a mind, that you know, in, in episode 87, we found out he had feelings and a sense of humor. Uh, set that aside. Uh, for you non-Star Trek ep uh, experts, just substitute your favorite robot here. Um, uh, the perception that to really, truly perceive that, or to come to a rational belief that someone else has in mind, there are two cognitive faculties at least that need to be involved, the agency detecting device and the theory of mind. We need to understand and, and believe truly that the person that we're in contact with is an agent and has a mind. Um, and it's those two faculties that put us in contact with a person, but they don't do it by perception. We don't perceive persons. We perceive bodies, we, we, preserve peop we preserve, sorry, perceive people's bodies, but we don't perceive persons. Um, any more than perceiving his body is evidence that he's a person. We don't infer, by the way, that people are uh, persons based on seeing their bodies. The characteristic mental life of a person's thoughts and feelings and desires are all interior. We can't see it. And this is the traditional problem of other minds, but the key point is we don't perceive persons. We perceive person bodies. And um, so we don't perceive them. The agency detecting device and the theory of mind work, but they don't work by way of perception. We don't get in contact with the person by way of perception. And just to make this point, there are lots of ways that we can come in contact with a person. Someone can send us a letter, an email, smoke signals, um, so there are many ways we can come in contact with a person that don't involve the visual perception of that person. All that's required is that somehow agency and theory of mind are, th those uh, cognitive faculties are reliably engaged in various contexts, which, in which context we form the true belief that the person we're communicating with is a person. So belief in other minds, we have to be in contact with the person. It has to engage the right cognitive faculties, but we don't have to be in perceptual contact with a person. So God and other minds has already been taken. Uh, so I did God and other elephants, back to my elephant thing. Um, and so what would it take for belief in God to be rational, roughly under this account? Well, if God is an agent and a person, Had and Tom are adequate to their objects. We need the right sort of processes in order to uh, acquire true beliefs about the, um, the, the thing with which we're in contact. So if, if God is an agent and a person, then the appropriate cognitive mechanisms will be the agency detecting device and theory of mind. And no doubt there'll be other cognitive faculties that'll be relevant. I just want to make the basic point. And as it is with persons, it's also hard to say how God might properly be the cause of God beliefs. And 
Um, and maybe it's harder to say how God would be the cause of God beliefs, but it's hard. In fact, no one really knows how persons are the cause of person beliefs. Um, uh, at least no one has a good argument to that effect about how persons are the cause of persons beliefs. Um, they seem to be mediated fairly directly by our cognitive faculties. So, and here's the key point I want to make about um, the God claim. God might not be the immediate, but he nonetheless might be the ultimate cause of God beliefs. God might not be in the immediate neighborhood of someone who acquires a God belief, but God, as he sets up the universe and decides that he wants human beings to have cognitive faculties that lead people to have true beliefs about him so that they can relate to him. And since um, uh, ADD and Tom also involve our relationships with one another so that we can properly relate to one another, um, he may have set the universe up in such a way that we would acquire true beliefs about God. And so he might be the ultimate cause of the faculties that produce God beliefs. The problem, I think, sometimes with the way Dawkins and Dennett put it is that they don't see God in the immediate neighborhood when God beliefs are produced. They, they view God as, um, as generally as absent when the God beliefs are produced. And so they view it like uh, when a stranger comes to your house at night, or sorry, when, when you hear a, a noise in your basement at night and, and you wake up and you think there's an agent and you start attributing purposes, but there is no agent there. And I think they roughly view God beliefs like that, that uh, you look at a cloud and you don't have an understanding of nature yet, and so you attribute God's power to the clouds. And the view is that God isn't there. There's nothing there except a cloud. And then there's this kind of fanciful imagination that projects God onto a cloud. I think that's roughly how they conceive it, and you can, you can read books on this and see that's, that I'm, I'm not far off the mark. But to me, their descriptions of the circumstances that produce belief in God are too thin. If you thicken them to include the history of the universe, then it's possible for God to be the ultimate cause of that belief. Um, now, God has to be the cause of that belief. So if there is a God who is the cause of that belief, and then uh, and if God is a person and an agent, then, um, then belief in God is likely rational. But if there is no God, then I think it's not the case. But my point here would be just by noting that there are cognitive faculties that are involved in the production of belief in God, that's not enough to prove that God beliefs are delusional or an illusion or not. You can't tell from that. You'd have to know without begging the question that there is or isn't a God in order for uh, you to show that the beliefs are rational or not. Nonetheless, it seems to me there are at least five ways uh, for, uh, uh, and maybe there'll be sometime the famous five ways to produce belief in God. It, so all we've looked at is theory of mind and the agency detecting device. There might be other ways that involve our cognitive faculties that produce rational belief in God. It's not as though it's only Tom and Had uh, someone could have a religious experience supposing there is a God, and if they have a direct experience of God, then that person could use Tom and Had to cognize their belief, and that belief could be rational. And there also could be a testimony change that terminates in the experiencer, so someone who has a religious experience could truly tell somebody else who truly tells somebody else who truly tells somebody else. Testimony is a reliable pro belief-producing mechanism, one we have to rely on, rely on quite a bit. So if there's a testimony chain that's reliably transmitted a true belief and it terminates in somebody who did have an experience of God, then belief in God could be rational. Someone might use their reasoning cognitive faculties to come to belief in God. And again, there might be a testimony change that terminates, chain that terminates in the reasoner. It's not as though if we discover that Tom and Had are involved in the production of God beliefs, that they're the only faculties that, that are, or that they're the only ways for belief in God to be um, reasonably produced. There might be other ways, that's my point. But they act as though there aren't other ways, um, and that there aren't other ways that might be consistent with our uh, cognitive faculties. So um, now we want to just quickly switch topics in the last minute and a half. I think what's good for the goose is good for the gander. And it seems to me if there's a cognitive science of religion, there also has to be a cognitive science of irreligion. Uh, 
I think people tend to talk about unreliable cognitive faculties because they think people that don't believe what they believe are irrational. Uh, that tends to be the way this works. Uh, but if there are cognitive faculties that produce really significant beliefs, well, it's likely that there are cognitive faculties involved in the production of atheist beliefs. Doc, sorry, Dennett himself says evolution is a universal acid. It, it affects or undermines everything that we think. Well, it affects or undermines everything that everybody else thinks, not what he thinks. It doesn't apply to any of his most precious beliefs. Um, but it should. It's a universal acid, Daniel Dennett. And this is from William James a long time ago. And, and there, have been, there have been cognitive explanations or psychological explanations of religious beliefs that go back for a long ways. And William James had the good sense to say this about them. Scientific theories are organically conditioned just as much as religious emotions are. And if we only knew the facts intimately enough, we should doubtlessly see the liver determining the dicta of the sturdy atheist as decisively as it does those of the Methodist under conviction anxious about his soul. They are equally organically founded, be they of religious or of non-religious content. So there have been two recent uh, and by recent, I mean within the past two years, studies of the cognitive psychology of atheism. Um, one, is a, one of them was in Nature, and this is the title, Analytic Thinking Promotes Religious Belief. And to me, it, it, it just contributes to the narrative that if you're an analytic, logical, rigorous thinker, you'll be an atheist, but intuitive thinkers are theists. Uh, and um, so this was published in there. And what they did what some of the psychologists did was they gave religious or prompts and they were designed to elicit analytic thinking and they said that it caused subjects to reduce religious belief. Uh, and so the analytic, they gave them analytic tasks or anal analytic control words like um, reason or thought um, or sometimes just analytic prompts. The, some had this prompt, the thinker, and then some had the, the control group had this other prompt, the discus thrower, I guess. And what they said was um, that they, sorry, what they said was the prompts, the analytic uh, tasks or the analytic primes, they said that they reduced religious belief. But I've read really carefully the studies, and near as I can tell, the only thing that they reduced was the subject's willingness to report the religious beliefs. Um, I don't see that looking at that, instead of looking at that, and then having to report your religious belief is likely to have produced a decline in religious belief. Um, in fact, I think it's intuitively unlikely. We don't typically change deep beliefs easily, but we do easily change reports of beliefs. There's a lot of psychology on how easy it is to get people to change their reports of belief. So it seems to me this is the best that it's shown. Somebody else has worked out that it, it you know, has some Kai thing that goes wrong. I didn't work it out. but. Uh, uh, anyway, this just seems so intuitively unlikely. Um, and at, at any rate, it just looks clear from what they've said. All, it, all, it, um, all we can conclude is there's reduced reporting re of religious belief. And I think we also see publish publisher bias. Um, there was a much better study or two much better studies done on cognitive science and autism. And um, I stole this uh, from Simon. This is Richard Dawkins' brain. Because it turns out the best studies on cognitive science and atheism actually show a connection, not, not only a connection between autism and atheism, it shows a causal connection between autism and atheism. I, I just will just mention these. You can take a look at them. But it turns out people with higher scores in an autism spectrum, spectrum uh, quotient have reduced ability to mentalize, to cognize mind. And they also have two to three times, um, they're two to three times more likely to identify as atheists. And on the autistic, autism spectrum, what these studies have shown is um, from females, you'll find the highest degree of religious beliefs, males lower degrees, professors even lower, scientists even lower, uh, and then up to autistics. But it turns out this precisely matches the autism scale. I, I told this to my wife. I said, um, Professors aren't really very good, are, you know, are, are higher on the autism scale than 
normal males, and they're higher on the autism scale than females, and males are higher on the autism scale than females, and we just, we're not really good at understanding other people's thoughts and emotions and desires, and she said, well, I've been telling you that for years. Um, so uh, at any rate, the discoveries that have been found here match what's been found on the autism. Uh, uh, they match the autism scale, and they match the autism scale with respect to declines in religious belief. So a couple quick concluding remarks. Jesse Baring, when he sees what cognitive science says about religious belief, he says, we've got God by the throat. All we need to do is squeeze. Uh, when atheists figure out that their belief in God involves a mental deficiency, that even if there were a God in the neighborhood, they'd be unlikely to cognize him, what they say is this. We emphasize that our data do not suggest that disbelief solely arises through mentalizing deficits. Multiple psychological and sociocultural pathways likely lead to a complex and overdetermined phenomena such as disbelief in God. Change equals for equals. I think you could say the same thing for God, except it tends not to be said. Thank you.